Hello and a very warm welcome. You're watching The Wire Wrap. I'm Stravasti Das Gupta. This week, the Himachal Pradesh government has taken a U-turn of sorts after Minister Vikramaditya Singh stated that following a similar directive in Uttar Pradesh, the Him in Himachal Pradesh as well, eateries uh, would have to display their names. Later, of course, after an uproar over this uh, whole statement, the Himachal Pradesh government has said no such directive has been issued. On the other hand, uh, the Delhi riots accused whose bail pleas have been pending for several years now will have to restart their bail plea hearings all over again because the judge who was hearing them has now been transferred. Meanwhile, in Maharashtra, the, in, uh, the accused in the Badlapur sexual uh, assault case has uh, been allegedly shot by the police and the move has been defended by the Mahayuti government even as the opposition has criticized it, uh, calling it a fake encounter. To discuss all this and more, we are being joined by Siddharth Vardarajan, he is founding editor at The Wire and Sanjay Hegre, he is a senior advocate in the Supreme Court. Siddharth, first off, uh, just starting with this whole issue around name plates, which we first saw during the Kavar Yatra in Uttar Pradesh when uh, the Uttar Pradesh government had mandated that such uh, eateries should display their names. Now, this time we are seeing in Himachal Pradesh, which is a Congress ruled government, that has come up with such an order and there has been a U turn of sorts. But it's not really clear whether the U-turn will result in no such order. They're just saying that we've sent it to a committee, they're going to examine it. So how do you see this whole uh, episode really? Well, there's a background in UP and there's a background in Himachal. And regrettably, both uh, of these backgrounds point to the same uh, causative factor, which is uh, communal tension, or I would say attempts to play the communal card. Uh, in Uttar Pradesh, during the Kabar Yatra, uh, an attempt was made to malign Muslim vendors and Muslim restaurateurs that these are, uh, you know, somehow serving polluted food to Yatris, that Yatris are not meant to eat. Uh, a new rule was invented for Hindu pilgrims that they are not allowed to buy food or drink from a Muslim vendor. This has never been the case for any pious. Hindu, uh, there's no there's no festival or ritual that requires you not to uh, buy your food from a from a you know that says you cannot buy from a Muslim. So this kind of rule is fabricated, and then in order to assuage so-called uh, feelings and sentiments of the cowards, this rule was created. And the you know the longer backdrop is, are the allegations made by the BJP, completely spurious, that Muslims are somehow out to contaminate the food and drink that they sell to Hindus in order to pollute them in order to spread Islam, who knows what, right? And so, so the Uttar Pradesh government introduced this rule, the Supreme Court said you can't have it. Uh, Himachal Pradesh, uh, I would imagine this decision communicated by Vikramaditya Singh, one minister, uh, is linked to uh, the events of the last two or three weeks, where on the uh, plea or under the guise of uh, illegal construction and so on, demands and mobilization is happening in Himachal against uh, a mosque in, in Shimla and then also in two, three other places. There was earlier an incident of a fight where uh, a person who happened to be Muslim assaulted a person who happened to be Hindu. And this has been now, you know, uh, made into a huge uh, wider Hindu-Muslim issue by politically motivated people. If the Congress in Himachal is doing this, if Vikramaditya Singh is raising this as an issue, uh, I can only say that uh, you have some Congress politicians who are unnerved by this by this uh, communalization which is happening and hope to steal a march on the BJP uh, or want to prevent the BJP from capitalizing on this issue. Uh, it's a very foolish strategy on the part of Mr. Singh and the Congress if they think that this is going to somehow help them. Uh, you are destroying the uh, fabric of society and you know, you know and the, the only logic of insisting on the name of somebody uh, is so that customers can know who is Muslim and who is not. If the idea is to assure vendors, uh, assure customers that uh, vendors are complying with licensing norms and so on, you could create a license and say that the license must be displayed. <coughs> uh, you know, that's not a, that's not a big deal. Um, you know, but to insist on the name of the proprietor has to be. Uh, and in Uttar Pradesh, they went one step further. They said not only the proprietor's name, but the names of all the employees. Uh, the idea clearly is to label Muslims. And I would say it's part of this sort of wider politics which has surfaced since COVID, where uh, the Bharti Janta Party and the wider Sangh Parivar 
are uh, pushing this you know crazy idea that there should be a boycott of muslims social boycott economic boycott uh, the the alleged reason then was that muslims are spreading covid which is which was you know complete rubbish and was quickly disproved uh, but uh, the fact is that boycotting muslims is very much part of the wider outlook of the sang parivar and i see all of this as a manifestation of that uh, we'll just come to the politics of that in just a moment but sanjay i want to ask you as siddharth was just mentioning that <clears throat> the supreme court of course put a stay on that order in uh, uttar pradesh during the kavar yatra but how legal are such orders because we've seen that the supreme court did put a stay but th this government in himachal went ahead and ordered it or the minister rather said uh, made an announcement of such a kind and uttar pradesh has also made such an order so how legal are such orders on the part of state governments and will they stand uh, judicial scrutiny see the point is that the previous order was time specific was with relation to the kavadi yatra so now what they've done is without any time specification for the entire time and uh, siddharth used one word which is at the heart of it the idea of pollution that you will be polluted if you eat food which is prepared by a, a muslim or by anybody else and you know the idea of food being polluted if it is prepared by somebody who is not of your own community then has another extension of caste as well yes uh, i come from a hotelier in community my community has most of the up <coughs> uh, or the udp hotels in bombay but they themselves never really uh, in the initial phases entered south india because another community had all all over south india what was called the brahmin hotels so people from my community who actually uh had to run vegetarian hotels uh, in south india some of them even pretended to be brahmin so there is at the heart of this particular uh, issue not a question of mere purity of ingredients mm. it's a question of purity and pollution of both the giver of food as well as the receiver of food so what they are pandering to is essentially that a person can ensure that he does not eat food from anybody who may be who may in any way pollute or defile him there have been very many great people even in the indian freedom movement who believed in such things there is a famous instance of uh, uh, madan mohan malviya who refused to pass on a glass of water to dr ambedkar so i do think that if these were challenged on being a form of untouchability these kind of orders would be very vulnerable to be struck down by a constitutional court and, and that's really the point because it's not just a communal a uh, concern right because it's also about when you display names of owners and employees there's a, india of course has a huge problem of uh, caste based discrimination which are opening up a whole group of people not just on religious lines but also on caste lines and the congress in a sense always has wanted to take a moral high ground in this regard with um, especially in comparison to the bjp we even saw that during the lok sabha election in their manifesto they said that we will not stop anyone from eating any food that they want to eat or practicing any religion the way they want to but there has been a sense of uh, strange silence from the high command we have heard reports that uh, rajiv shukla who's the himachal in charge he spoke to vikramaditya singh and apparently cracked the whip but um, but for a party which is constantly taking a moral high ground in a sense in comparison to the bjp on such grounds calling for a caste census on one side no religious discrimination for it's one of the governments under it to uh, come up with something like this and not really address the concerns is that uh, disquieting no it's it's hugely embarrassing for the congress and the congress high command and leadership as you put it because the party or certainly a party minister has been caught pandering to some of the worst forms of backwardness uh, that india has known right this idea that uh, only food prepared by somebody of your own caste or community is what you are allowed to eat and that you will shun food or or drinks prepared by others this is a highly backward uh, and you know idiotic belief and for the congress to be caught in a situation where one of its ministers is pandering to this idea is is terrible right i would imagine the congress you know whenever these things happen uh you know politicians try to think what's the best way of damage control 
and in their mind g- getting the himachal government to issue a statement uh, contradicting what this minister said is probably the damage control uh, of first choice so they said chalo usko khatam karte by saying there is no such policy right but somewhere down the line preferably in public but also through its own internal channels of communication the congress party has to ensure that its own leaders uh you know are clear about what the party's policies are right so you can't have uh, mr rahul gandhi uh speaking about the inequities of caste or uh, you know talking about the need for a caste census and doing justice and so on and then you have this kind of thing which is although in this instance in my view in himachal is aimed primarily at muslims but obviously uh, if you have a caste hindu who is uh, who believes in backward ideas of pollution and purity uh, they will then want to avoid uh, an eatery or a vendor if the that person's name is not that of a brahmin or or whatever right uh, so it's 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 you know the party uh, and this is something we've always suspected right about the congress we've known that this party uh, employs rhetoric and ideology at the at the sort of supra level but internally uh, there is no clarity there is no training there is no uh, uh, shall we say uh, check made on what is it that the party cadre and mid level leaders actually you know what is their world view what is their ideology there is there's no there's no attempt to train people in 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 there's like another light and thoughts yes. there's another problem in himachal the himachal government survived a scare yeah and vikramaditya singh and his people was you know, threatening to break away yeah. so they can't really put him down also they can't discipline him <coughs> and this may well be his signaling that you know i to share certain ideas with the bjp and i may not be averse yeah. to switching mm-hmm. over and i so think there's a lot of signals and yeah. counter signals yeah. going on and as the bhat mentioned we can't uh, we can't discount the fact that this is already happening in the background of all this communal tension that is we are seeing in himachal in uh, shimla sanjauli which has yeah. spread to other areas and there also the government has been found wanting their response has not been what it should be so uh, that kind of ties up to what you're mentioning i think so because uh, himachal is a state where the government shifts every 5 years and it's a few communities which sort of make up their mind often it's the government servants who also make up their mind but nevertheless it's largely a a state which has uh, brahmins and thakurs who dominate so uh, both these uh, both the bjp and the congress are in effect uh, trying for the same vote but well, we'll have to see how this really pans out because right now all eyes are on the himachal government and how they plan to handle it and whether they are really different from uttar pradesh as they claim to be or they are not but on the other hand um, here in delhi the delhi high court is all set to hear afresh the bail pleas of several accused in the delhi rights cases now this is after um, a, the judge who was hearing the case had uh, been transferred now he's going to be the chief justice of madhya pradesh and now the bail pleas of several accused who are activists this includes gulf Shah Fatima, Khalid Saifi, <coughs> Salim Khan, Shifa Ur Rahman. Now their lawyers have already argued their cases twice before different judges. Now for a third time they will have to argue afresh. Now this is of course coming in the background of the Supreme Court in recent days making remarks about how bail is the rule and jail is the exception. But in uh, cases like this, we continue to see that this is not the case, and um, and this is continuing to happen for the past few years. How do you see this? well there is a problem here now normally grant of bail is a 5 minute 10 minute decision okay is he a flight risk is he likely to threaten witnesses and things like that but these are cases under the uapa and in the uapa the supreme court added to oh, the mess by a judgment called vatali which said that you know there, there are those rigorous bail conditions that you will not give bail unless you think that the person is not guilty of the offense and uh, you have heard the public prosecutor at at length so the supreme court then said that you can't really uh, determine that with uh, at the bail stage without uh, something almost akin to a trial so you really have to have 
huge hearings in these matters. And uh, what also happens is that these matters tend to follow the senior judges of the High Court. The senior judges of the High Court are either on the verge of retirement or of elevation to as Chief Justice elsewhere or as uh, or to the uh, Supreme Court or something like that. And somewhere down the uh, line, I mean this this time I think the judge reserved it for nearly six months with uh, and has not delivered a verdict. So, it has to be uh, heard again. One of the reasons why, why judges who are on the verge of uh, elevation or promotion or something like that do not want to really uh, give a judgment is that sometimes they think that oh that might be a reason for the government to sit on their their files. So, then what is the way uh, out of this? In the, the, way, the, the way out of it is for possibly the a, a younger set of judges to be assigned this <coughs> matter and to hear it as fast as possible. Maybe the Supreme Court should tell the Chief Justice of the uh, of the Delhi High Court that these matters have to be finished within such a in such a thing, and there are informal ways of doing it so that uh, if the High Court judges <coughs> feel that this is beyond their pay grade, it comes at least to the Supreme Court. Also, uh, Siddharth, we saw recently um, families of these accused, these um, uh, activists really, they held a meeting in New Delhi which we had also reported on and they spoke about the fact that the that the fact that the Supreme Court constantly is talking about bail as the rule and jail is just the exception gives them a sense of hope. But then every time their cases come up and something like this happens that they have to argue all over again, they lose that sense of hope. And um, in that meeting, in fact, uh, Advocate Shahrukh Alam raised something very interesting that uh, she said that the Supreme Court Recently, when it took uh, so motor cognizance of the RG Kaur rape protest, uh, it says that protest is a form of national catharsis. So, who decides when a protest is a form of national catharsis and when it's not, and and who's going to lay down these uh, these rules really? You know, there's a phrase used uh, by by the judges themselves in cases when they're commenting on uh, things done by the lower court, which is judicial indiscipline. You know, when, when judges don't follow the rules and norms, when judges go against uh, precedents and orders given by, uh, by similar benches or larger benches and try to make up the law, you know, in a very, uh, on a, uh, or implement the law on a very contingent basis, uh, I would fling this accusation, frankly, uh, at the Supreme Court. Because uh, it's all very well to say <coughs> bail is a rule, jail the exception. Uh, I uh, and yes, many of these matters are are ordered are argued at the trial court stage or even the high court stage. But even when something comes to the Supreme Court, uh, one of the Bhima Koregaon accused, Mahesh Raut, got his bail more than a year and a half, two years ago from Bombay High Court, and the matter uh, has been stayed by the Supreme Court and is not being is not being heard. Uh, rather, he got it for the trial court. It's been stayed by the Supreme Court, and now the can has been. Uh, no, it's still it's still hanging in the. It's still it's still hanging in the. But the point is that you know when 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 the lower court has given bail, uh, I can understand you put a stay for a day or two, a couple of weeks to ascertain some facts, but to let the matter hang for a year and a half, and uh, I would say that in Dante's Inferno, the worst levels of hell should be reserved for judges who leave a post without having delivered verdicts, particularly verdicts that they sat on for weeks and months. I should say, in fact, I would like to say that a judge is not eligible to take up a promotion or a transfer until he or she clears their docket. I think it's a crime. Or they have to <coughs> refund their salary or, and all the expenses incurred in hearing a matter on which they, which they reserve judgment six months ago and don't deliver the judgment and then leave the court. I can't imagine in any other line of work uh, an employee or somebody in senior management would be allowed to get away with this kind of, uh, you know, indiscipline, this kind of behavior. Uh, so I would say, you know, uh, it's it's time for the bar and for, for for the you know community of judges and retired judges to figure out a way of dealing with this problem of reserve ju judgments being kept in reserve endlessly, and then the judge retires or is transferred, and the matter has to be reheard. It's unacceptable. I, I can't imagine in which other democratic country or which other country where you have a well-functioning legal system would such behavior by judges be tolerated. 
so I think it's it's time to devise some kind of a, you know, at the very least there should be a life. There should there should be a spoke. There should be a a dashboard uh, for every judge telling us how many at any point in time how many judgments has this person reserved, and for how long it was for how long have those judgments been reserved, and if he or she is leaving a court with judgments still left hanging, then. You know, this there should be some penalty associated with that. And it's very interesting because yesterday, when the Supreme Court was granting bail to Senthil Balaji, the Tamil Nadu minister, uh, the Supreme Court, and that's in the PMLA case where also bail is very difficult. And uh, the uh, court really said that, uh, that there's unlikely possibility that hearing is going to be con trial is going to be conducted anytime soon on, and going to be concluded anytime soon and granted uh, him bail. So, so this is really strange that politicians can get bail even after a certain period of time they also should not be in jail for 15 16 20 months uh, pending trial but we've seen kejriwal has got bail a host of aam aadmi party leaders have got bail himan soren has got bail now uh, this tn minister has also got bail but common people their bail pleas are just not coming up yeah it's so difficult to get a hearing and it's pretty easy to derail the hearing sometimes the uh, prosecutor uh, says that uh, the, uh, there will be a law officer appearing and so many things. I, I think the, as Siddharth said, uh, you know, judges also should realize that they have a responsibility. The responsibility is to stand for the citizen against the despotism of the state. The judges and the judiciary act as the bricks. If they, if you if you take the entire state machinery to be a, a, a vehicle, a car, or something of that kind, the executive can accelerate. But to keep it on the straight path, you need the brakes. And if judges, if the brakes fail, the entire system can crash. So uh, judges must realize that at the end of the papers, there are human lives, yeah. and the, and very often it is like. Okay, what can we do today? Can we hear it? Is it not? It's why can't we hear it? That should possibly be the approach. And uh, rather than the detainee making out a case as to why he should be bailed out, it should be the prosecution which should, should uh, make out a case as to why that man has to be kept in jail pending a trial which may or may not take place uh, at any uh, given length of time. Okay, can I make one more point before we move on? I think I think Mr. Hegde hit the nail on the head when he said that many of these judgments, particularly in sensitive cases, are reserved and kept pending because judges fear their future prospects will be compromised if they give a judgment uh, that goes against the grain or against the government. Uh, and this essentially what 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 this tells us is that the problem really lies in the way in which the executive is trying to manipulate the judiciary, is trying to cherry pick which judges get transferred when we know that the decisions for appointments and transfers is taken by the by the Supreme Court Collegium. But by sort of applying the brakes on certain files, accelerating certain files, sitting on files you know for, for months on end without giving any reason, the the government exercises enormous leverage. And we saw the Collegium itself buckling. Uh, a couple of weeks ago when they, for no reason, uh, I mean, the, the, the government was sitting on the file of uh, Suresh Kaith and others being sent as chief justice to the different courts. And when the Supreme Court said, why are you sitting on the file? The AG said, we have some sensitive material to, to, co to communicate. This material was given in a sealed envelope, following which the collegium shuffled and, and a couple of judges who were going to High Court A and B went to C and D instead, right? And you'd imagine what kind of, you know, uh, what kind of system is this, where some some material <coughs> is given, and I can't imagine uh, if if this is material which compromises the ability of somebody to become chief justice of High Court A. Are we expected to believe that it doesn't compromise his ability to be chief justice of of High Court B? What kind of material is this that says if you send him to Kashmir, he will be compromised, but you, it's okay to send him to Madhya Pradesh. You know, it's it's completely illogical, crazy stuff, and the 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 collegium swallows this, and and does essentially what the government wants. 
So, if you are going to have a situation operating like this, where the collegium which is supposed to, you know, the, the collegium system evolved because the, 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 the Supreme Court judges said that we can't trust the, the executive with the selection of judges, but the government, you effectively give them veto power uh, uh, about who goes where. Just, just Akhil Qureshi uh, was left cooling his heels for months on end before finally being sent to Tripura. Just as Murli Dhar was, uh, was mistreated. Just as Shakhdar who recently uh, retired, right? Oh, no, 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 he, he, he is now going he, he to recently got, he's gone to Himachal, right? Uh, you know, the way he was mistreated and being shunted out to, uh, to Tamil. Tamil Nadu, uh, to the Madras High Court soon after he gave that Priya Pillai judgment. You know, all of this <coughs> uh, tells us that the problem really lies with the way in which the executive is trying to control the judiciary. I think just one last point before we move on from this topic is not just how the executive is managing uh, the collegium system, but also the fact that post-retirement jobs have become such a huge thing in the past few years that um, we see someone who is a CJI, he's in the Rajya Sabha and it's it's a huge point of discussion. And, and in your opinion, does this also affect how they adjudicate cases? We've had a Calcutta High Court judge who joined the BJP and announced very promptly that I was in touch with the BJP and the BJP GP was in touch with me. He's talking about when he was a judge and, and that's all accepted. So, these post-retirement jobs also playing a role here in your opinion? Well, I don't know who it was who said, I think during the era of the committed judiciary, that's Indira Gandhi's era, that there were uh, forward-looking judges and judges who looked forward. So, <laughs> so it, 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 it has often been, I think, a crisis of character. And there is really uh, nothing that uh, people can do except if you have an <coughs> institutional setup so, so firm that anybody who strays from the path is instantly shunned. But that has not been the case, whether it is in India, whether it has been whether in your own profession of journalism or, uh, or in our profession of law. Those who have strayed from the path have often been rewarded and others then end up uh, watching from the sidelines and wondering whether they were idiots all along. Just so, they, so they, 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 there's just one uh, uh, <coughs> sentence before I finish. Somebody said uh, brilliantly that uh, if you are given an order, you tend to resent it. But if you can anticipate an order, you revel in your cleverness. <laughs> That's what happened. You know, just as Gugoy went to this, when he went to the uh, Raj Sabha, he said he would be a bridge yeah. between the judiciary and the and, and legislature and vice versa. You know, it's been nearly what four or five years since he joined there. I believe he's made only one speech. Yeah, so, so the so the you know wonder what kind of I I reckon he's one like one of those Bihar bridges that uh, you know, that keeps Go collapse, nowhere. That, that goes nowhere or collapses, right? I mean, this is the, this, this is the kind of person we're talking about. So, if we are talking about how extrajudicial things are happening, also the fact that in Maharashtra, the Badlapur sexual assault accused Akshay Shinde, he was killed in an alleged enqu encounter earlier this week on Monday, in fact. And uh, the Bombay High Court um, has come down very heavily on the police um, in its statements and made some scathing remarks, saying that it is very hard to believe that the accused would have seized the pistol and uh, would have uh, opened fire. But the ruling Mahayuti government, which includes the BJP and the Shiv Sena, uh, including Chief Minister. Mr. Eknath Shinde have defended the police actions and, and uh, said to the tune of what if he had uh, attacked the police. And we have seen such encounters in Uttar Pradesh, but it now seems to have spread to Maharashtra and is being openly yeah. welcomed, defended. A same rule book kind of playing out in your opinion? You know, Shravasti, I, I once joked that uh, the last time we had this kind of a case, I think Tamil Nadu, uh, that obviously in police academy, there is a course taught on how to bump off a prisoner, how to bump off an under trial. And it seems that the that course has only one chapter, which is that once you arrest somebody, you keep him in custody for a couple of days, then you decide he needs to be taken to the scene of the crime or to some other place, usually in the dead of the night. And while being transported or when he gets to the gets to the scene of the crime, there's some variation is allowed. Uh, the person will suddenly snatch uh, a weapon from a constable. And uh, then he will escape and then he, he, they're forced to shoot him. The only variation that has come into this, uh, into this textbook, sort of into this lesson of how to, how to kill an under trial, is that because 
this was such a blatant story uh, many of the police party that get involved with this go through the motion of picking one guy and injuring him so there will usually be one or two cops who will sustain minor injuries uh, in the in this process of this uh, so called accused running away i've seen this in in assam there was a case uh, about about 10 days ago where where a person was supposedly handcuffed to uh, a policeman and he drowned he jumped into a pond and drowned but the policeman who was attached to him through the handcuff didn't was not drowned and was unable to save him here we are told the chap wasn't even handcuffed so you know they should come up with better stories is what i feel the guy who designed this course in the police academy should be sacked or retired ek naya textbook taiyar kiya jaye so that at least cops can come up with better more plausible stories because as the high court itself has said uh, you know it's completely unbelievable that uh, you know you could you could take somebody and be overpowered in this way and uh, and that he and that you end up then shooting him in the head Uh, like a great marksman you know that you are so obviously this is these are preplanned things and you see it's many people find it the reason the police gets away is because they play on the morality they appeal to the wider sense of morality of i would say middle class society that this chap after all you know he doesn't deserve to live he's a rapist he raped children etc etc uh, or somebody's a terrorist Uh, so once uh, one or the hyderabad case where there were i think four guys yeah. who gang raped uh, a, a young woman near a toll booth right uh, and there was outrage for several days and then they were bumped off and you 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 count on the public approving of this sort of swift justice and perhaps you're right perhaps the public does approve of this but what people forget right and this is particularly germane in this case <coughs> that eliminating a suspect in this way also serve could also serve i'm leaving the question open it could also serve to allow the real perpetrator to get away because what happens when you shoot a suspect you you have one man accused he runs away like a guilty person you shoot him dead case is closed this means there will be no further investigation into who is it actually who uh, molested those young kids uh, or who is it in you know when when it's when there terrorism cases involved uh, the killing of six in chitisingpura in uh, in 2000 the uh, uh, indian army and the police caught hold of four or five villagers bumped them off at panchal than and the case was closed ever since then there's been no investigation into who the terrorists were who shot dead uh, 35 sikh uh, males in chitisingpur right so so i would say we need to worry because somewhere down the line this attitude of the cops is allowing real culprits to get scot- get away scot free so if you you may be okay with the killing of a suspect you shouldn't be but okay let's say you justify it in some you know some warped sense of morality but you're endangering society because there could be a child rapist out there still who was breathing a very you know big sigh of relief and he may well be politically connected for all we know i also want to say that uh, of course there's a huge public uh, hysteria surrounding this whether it's an encounter or it's the use of what has come to be known as bulldozer justice all of this is really appreciated by by uh, a large section of the public clearly because the politicians really want to play with that we saw as recently as last week in haryana uh, chief minister yogi adityanath he brought a bulldozer to the uh, to his campaign rally even the supreme court has c- come down so heavily and said that this is not uh, how the rule of law should progress and in fact adityanath himself has announced how many encounters had t- has taken place since he has taken power just to give a sense of the figures in september 2023 he announced that uh, ever since he has uh, become chief minister in march 27 Uh, 2017 the police have shot 190 persons in incidents of alleged exchange of fire that the state terms as encounters now are extra judicial killings bulldozer justice these things becoming a norm that is being used for political gains without any significant backlash in your opinion no there is no backlash in fact there is support for it mm. that is the real problem you see the uh, while i was looking at the badlapur thing the image that swung to my mind was that of a bombay policeman called tukara mombale tukara mombale was on duty on 2611 and it was at his stop that uh, ajmal kasab was finally captured and his mates he had been shot and he, his mates were about to shoot kasab and he said don't do it and but for kasab surviving then 
we would not have had the entire trial the entire uh, appeals process which allowed us to tell the world what we had been through and who its perpetra real perpetrators were so, so you see the public likes this idea of a dirty harry or instant justice but what the public doesn't get is that the dirty harrys then become uh, terrorists themselves in one sense the apta chappan gang, gang we then become vasuli experts what was happening this has happened in bombay earlier also where all these so called encounter specialists all of them then ended up with problems about huge money unaccountable money what was also happening was one criminal gang would set off the policeman the encounter specialist about another policeman another, uh, another, uh, gang. another uh, gang so that so in effect the policeman became this gang's executioner against the other gang so this is a dangerous path right now where we are sitting i mean about say uh, a kilo, less than a kilometer in connaught place there was an encounter when i had just become a lawyer uh, in delhi in the 90s the policeman was a fellow called satyavid singh rathi who was a dsp and an encounter specialist shot a businessman and then pretended that nothing had gone, uh, gone wrong it we, they were uh, uh, gangsters from western up which was in quite in quite a gangster mode in those days and then the families had to barge in, into the press conference and tell them tell people what it was and then satyavid uh, rathi ended up uh, serving a life sentence what encounters do is to debase your policeman and your constable they become specialists at not only encounters but in criminal behavior and finally before we close i want to ask uh, you both the the fact is that we don't have a law that is prevents any such encounters that supreme court has laid there down guidelines no, no no there is no law which sanctions an encounter yeah. hmm. a policeman has no special rights under the ipc except that of self defense so the policeman who creates a situation where he has to resort to self defense is obviously in the wrong <coughs> and I, i just one thing i disagree with the siddharth about uh, uh, that there have been no amendments in that chapter the up police came out with a superb amendment the entire uh, vehicle started overturning <laughs> There is that at least to in the case of the gangster they picked up from yes, Madhya Pradesh. Yes, and why? Yeah. Why? You had the entire media tracking yes. the fellow's journey, yeah. and everybody knew in advance that something was going to happen. And despite the media tracking, they yeah. that that, uh, that uh, uh, whatever gypsy or whatever overturned. the man who was killed so do you think that that there should be a special law now made to tackle this particular problem of extrajudicial killings encounters that that now the supreme court is talking about uh, laying down guidelines in the case of bullo- bulldozer justice do we need a separate law perhaps to tackle this and is it possible at all by see, politicians who are celebrating this see the thing is that the, the, the laws perhaps already exist right uh, as mr hegde says um, you know right of self defense is available to everybody and uh, that's the only right which the police can invoke to shoot somebody and if there is a if there is a death in fact he may correct me if i'm wrong but it requires a registration of an fir and an investigation a magisterial to, uh, a magisterial inquiry to establish that this death was not a wrongful death right so uh, and i suspect that in many cases that requirement is 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 given the go by there's also a requirement that every police station must have cctvs but we saw in the horrible case from bhuvaneshwar from orissa the other day uh, how you could have an army officer and his fiance being assaulted in a police thana uh, and uh, there being and then the cops saying the cctv isn't working so i think if there are injuries in in uh, i think the way new norms can evolve is if there are injuries or deaths in a police station and they turn around and say the sh turns around and says there's no cctv or the cctv isn't working there should be a presumption of guilt uh i would i would say that there's a suggestion that uh an assam magistrate made uh in uh <coughs> in one of the jignesh mewani cases when he was arrested from gujarat brought to uh assam and uh let off in this one case for which he was arrested and the police were so frustrated that they alleged that he had molested a police woman in the jeep 
from the airport to the court and then tried to book him under a fresh charge. And the, the judge wouldn't have that either. And the judge made a suggestion that body cams uh, and dash cams should be mandatory uh, for policemen and women, for, for, for police vehicles. So that, <coughs> and, and you know, the, you, this is true in, in the UK and the US, for example, uh, you have body cam evidence now. So it becomes that much more difficult for uh, cops to make. Uh, so I think some of these kinds of innovations, rather than legal changes, I think we have the laws. You don't have a political will, as you said, uh, the cops uh, get away because the politicians encourage them. And there is also, I think, what you meant when uh, when you said there is a lacuna is that uh, sanction to prosecute. So uh, a policeman guilt, accused of uh, an encounter crime or a, or a murder, the, the prosecutors still have to go, go through that hurdle of getting sanctioned to prosecute because they're a public servant. I think under the old IPC and BNS, uh, that permission is still required. Uh, so, so I think we need to get rid of some of these things. Uh, if there is no CCTV and it's a custodial death, uh, the requirement of sanction to prosecute should automatically be waived. You know, I think that some of these innovations, if, if, if the courts can, can push, maybe we would be in a better place. All right, those are important questions, all of which is closely tied to political will. Of course, at the end of the day, it all does kind of boil down to that. We'll see how those uh, questions really shape up in the coming days. Thank you so much, Siddharth and Sanjay, for joining us and to your viewers for joining us. And I'll see you next week.